Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Tracy, thanks to the invention of the microscope centuries ago, we're now able to understand, or we were able to understand, how bacteria can cause and transmit infections in people. But now we're figuring out that communities of bacteria inside our bodies, known as the human microbiome, actually (laughs) help us and keep us healthy. And when that normal population of bacteria is disrupted, for whatever reason, it can lead to serious health problems. At Mayo Clinic, physicians and researchers are busy studying the relationship between the microbiome and health and disease. And joining us in studio is the co-director of the Mayo Clinic Center for Individualized Medicine Microbiome Program, Dr. Perna Kashyap. Welcome back to the program. It's good to see you again. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. Dr. Kashyap, nice to have you. Uh, So tell us, when did we figure out that there were, that our our bodies were full of bacteria? I think we've always known that our bodies are full of bacteria. The challenge was we didn't know how to study them because we had to rely on culturing, and we can culture only a very small fraction of the bacteria. So and by culture, you mean that you take a swab or a specimen and you put it on a Petri dish and it grows bacteria? Exactly, so, so very small number of bacteria are amenable to that kind of identification, where we can just take a swab and put them on a Petri dish and, and they'll grow. So as a result, we always thought that we can't figure out what other bacteria are there till the DNA technology hit the roof and we now can sequence everything so we don't need to take swabs and grow them on petri dishes so your your website says that there are 10 times more microbes than in our body than we have cells so when you say microbes most of them are bacteria but what are the others so you have fungi you have bacteriophages you have viruses so there's multiple microorganisms that exist and they exist in in sort of a harmony and in terms of the number of bacteria, I think that that thought has changed. It's not really that important whether it's 10 times the number of cell bacteria that are present or, or, or you know, five times. But what's more relevant is that these bacteria perform important metabolic functions, which are equally important as to what we do. So they, you have to consider the body as a whole of what we do as well as what these microbes are doing at any given time. They're on us, in us, everywhere. Every orifice. Every orifice. And yeah. the skin. And the skin. It seems like the one that is most of most interest, though, is the one that is in the gut. That is true. That's the best uh, studied because, uh, as you know, all diseases start in the gut. So I'm a gastroenterologist, so I have to believe that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yes, the gut microbiome has been the one which has been best studied because the gut microbes have been shown. One, it was the easiest place to sample. Um, and two, it's been associated with... with Diseases not only within the GI tract, but also outside the GI tract, like rheumatoid arthritis or Parkinson's or other neurological diseases. So, so these associations have put an interest in these gut microbes. And what do these gut mi- microbes do that's good for us? The gut microbes are essentially breaking down things that we are incapable of breaking down. So when you eat an apple, you will break down part of that apple, and the rest which goes down into your colon, the bacteria feed on that. And in that process, they're going to produce substances which are good for the health of your colon cells. And they also provide a source of energy. So, so a small part of the calories that we get are because the bacteria are able to utilize what we cannot utilize. So what, what keeps them from growing out of control? So like I said, in, in, in homeostasis or in, in, a, in a harmonious situation, they are, are kept in bay in terms of the number and, and what they're doing is by by the host. So, but you know, we uh, have an immune system which keeps everything in check. So it's almost a bi-directional relationship where the microbes will direct what the host should do, but the host will also direct to some extent what the microbes should do. And so, as you can imagine, it's in neither's best interest to try to overextend unless the conditions are right for that. Except for, that's fine, the microbiome knows that, and they're following the rules, but we are not following the rules by what we put in our mouth or the antibiotics that we take, et cetera. Yeah, so you know, we just have to come to the realization that everything that we do not only affects us, but also affects the bacteria. What we eat is what the bacteria eat. What you take in terms of antibiotics or medications, it's gonna have an effect on the bacteria. And, and sometimes you do need them. I mean, you know, it's not that uh, people shouldn't be taking antibiotics. They are needed. They're 
used to treat serious conditions and, and they're indicated. But yes, the everything that we do can have an effect on the bacteria in our gut. But they're not that fragile. They will recover pretty quickly back to their original state. So you have to really beat them down to move them away. It's mm -hmm. not that you just, you know, do a small thing and they'll just go out of whack. So what beats them down? So if you had to take recurrent courses of antibiotics, let's say you know you took one and then a month later you had to take another one and then a month later you had to take another one, and sometimes people have to, that will take a toll on the bacteria because now before they can recover back to their original position, you've sort of hit them again and hit them again. Uh, you travel, if you travel a lot and you know, you're, not, you're changing your habits every day, that can affect what the bacteria look like. So there's plenty of things which can uh, in the long run, but uh, also there are diseases which can affect the bacteria. So when the intestine's inflamed, that's going to drive a certain kind of bacteria which can survive well in that inflammation and maybe perpetuate it. And so what happens when you kill too many of the good guys and they can't recover? So one of the dangers is when you t take too many of the good guys down, the opportunists can now come in because now there is that they were kept at bay because these good guys cooperated with each other and did not allow any openings to exist. But as soon as you kill a few of these good guys, there's a web which now breaks down. And as soon as you break down that web, you have a lot of different nutrients which are now available to an opportunist. And so C. difficile or Clostridium difficile is one such example, which you hear all the time in the hospital. It's one of the most common conditions uh, in terms of infections which gets transmitted in hospitals. And that's an opportunist. It's always present around us, but it cannot do us harm till the microbiome is disrupted to an extent that it cannot drive it away. Clostridium difficile, Clostridium. C. difficile infection. And most of those infections are acquired in the hospital. Well, uh, not entirely true because we are learning that uh, nearly 30% or more may be in the community without being in the hospital. So it's, it's not just in the hospital, but yes, hospital transmission has been one of the big ways by which C. difficile has been transmitted, but that's not the only way you get. Is there a link between what's happening with our microbiome and things like gluten sensitivity or IBS or food allergies? Are those things linked? We, we definitely think so. Um, so one thing the bacteria does is it, it trains or um, helps our immune system develop. And, and that happens fairly early in childhood. Uh, and when that happens, it sort of programs the immune system. And what people are trying to figure out is if that programming goes awry, what happens when you grow up? Could you develop allergies? Could you develop uh, you know, uh, sensitivities or autoimmune conditions? Uh, it's still in the research realm. But the reason we think that it has a role to play is because there are certain kind of bacteria which can drive immune responses in one direction or the other, which tells you that clearly there is uh, uh, a symphony which goes on early on, and that's why there is so much interest in early life microbiome in terms of what you acquire at birth, what's the effect of uh, feeding, what's the effect of the environment, because that's the most vulnerable stage when the microbiome is developing. Is there anything to go along with the fact, to, to flip it the other way, that like our grandparents used to say, the problem with you kids today is that you're not getting dirty enough, that you're too clean. And when you talk about um, the microbiome having something that has to, it has to kind of wrestle with, it kind of makes me think my grandpa might have been right. Well, there's definitely the hygiene hypothesis, and that's how you know this idea that allergic conditions are more prevalent in the West as compared to the East came by, and you know, there might be, there likely is some truth to that. It doesn't mean that everybody should be rolling around in dust, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe the dust at that time was much cleaner than what it is right now, and maybe <laughs> it was full of good bacteria. So I don't think, uh, you know, unwanted exposure is a good idea, but, but definitely there's some truth to that, you know, you need bacteria to help train your immune system. So there is some clinical application to what you have learned in the laboratory, particularly with regard to C. difficile. So tell us what you do when uh, it doesn't respond to antibiotic treatment and the mi microbiome of the gut has been disrupted. Yeah, so you know, if, if somebody does not respond well and they kept, keep getting C. difficile infection, uh, we can do what we call as a fecal microbiota transplantation. Amazing. And what that means is you just take a healthy bacteria from an individual who does not have any disease and who does not have any infections. After testing the stool, we can transfer that bacteria into the gut of somebody who has uh, this recurrent C. difficile. And we do this typically with a colonoscopy, but there are other ways of introducing it. And the idea is exactly what I said. You know, you, When you kill too many of the good bacteria, they are not able to recover well on their own. 
so what you're doing is now you're artificially providing this whole community of good bacteria, which will very quickly start cooperating with each other, and they will drive C. difficile away. Our guest is the co-director of the Microbiome Program at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Perna Kashyap. Time for a short break. When we come back, we'll talk more about the human biome, plus we'll cover pro, uh, probiotics. Uh, a lot of people are taking them. Are they really doing them any good? And we'll learn about a study that finds that an individualized diet is best for controlling blood sugar. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McCrae. Our guest is the co-director of the Microbiome Program of Mayo Clinic, Dr. Perna Kashyap. We've been talking about the human biome and how important it is to, in keeping us uh, healthy. We've talked about the gut microbiome. Uh, tell us what else you're studying in your lab that you're particularly interested in. So the Microbiome Program at Mayo is unique in that its, its goal is to be able to bring microbiome science to the practice, to see how we can change clinical practice based on what we learn about the microbiome. And one of the areas that we are focused on is cancer. As you know, cancer is important not only in terms of how cancer develops, but also how we treat cancer. And we're now learning that bacteria can not only dictate in how people may develop cancer, but also how they respond to chemotherapy. If they develop side effects from chemotherapy, how effective a chemotherapy regimen may be. So we've always underestimated the role microbes can play in individualized responses of why some people do really well with the treatment and some people do not. And one of the components which we had been missing, I think, is the microbes, and, and we need to start paying attention. So How are they affected by chemotherapy? So the, mic the chemotherapy, depending on what kind of chemotherapy, can cause the microbiome to get disrupted, but more importantly, the microbes have similar enzymes as what our body carries, which means that they can detoxify or retoxify drugs that we take, which means if our body detoxified a drug and it enters the GI tract, now the bacteria can convert it back into an active component and cause diarrhea. And that's very common in some of the chemotherapy regimens, and it's shown that people who have higher amounts of certain bacterial enzymes can get diarrhea with chemotherapy. What, what do you hope to learn that can actually be of clinical application for cancer patients? So what we hope to be able to do is be able to stratify the right treatment for the right patient. So right now what we do is we give everybody a regimen and see how they do and who develops side effects and then decide, okay, we should switch. But if we can a priori develop a strategy where say that because of your genetics and your microbiome, you're less likely to respond to this or you're more likely to get a... Uh, side effects, then, you know, we can optimize treatment very well for patients and, and save them this trouble of going through sequential treatments till we find the best fit for them. And that, I think, leads into the study that you did about controlling glucose levels in patients who have diabetes. You learned that somehow the microbiome had an influence on that, and an individualized diet was best for controlling blood glucose. What do you mean by individualized diet, and, diet, and how do you study someone's microbiome? So studying the microbiome depends on the site that you want to study. And so for the gut microbiome, the, the best sample to take is the stool. Uh, that's what we use, and we can break it down into its DNA and then just sequence the DNA. We don't need to put anything on a Petri dish anymore. And once we put it, get the DNA and we sequence it, we can then determine what kind of bacteria are present in somebody's gut. Now, everybody carries a unique microbiome, which means that my bacteria would look very different from yours. It doesn't mean they're all doing different things. They may be doing the same thing, but they don't all look the same, which means ba multiple bacteria can do the same thing. Uh, when we talk about individualized diets, all it means is that we are now realizing that the differences that individuals have in response to food or other components, uh, microbiome plays a role in that. And this study was first, uh, it had its origins in Israel when a group of researchers first looked at a group of Israeli um, individuals and found that if you know a person's microbiome, you can develop an algorithm to predict how they would respond to individual food components in terms of change in their blood glucose. Hmm. What we did was we needed to make sure that the similar strategy would work in Americans. And so here at Mayo Clinic, we worked with the company as well as our researchers and tried to validate that study in the American population. And we found exactly the same, that if you have information about an individual's microbiome, we can predict how an individual's blood glucose would change in response to different food items and not food groups. 
And the idea with individualized diets is right now we know that low carbohydrate diet, for example, is good to bring your blood glucose down. But it's also very hard to follow. You can't just cut down everything that you eat. And this strategy allows you to pick and choose the good and the bad components within those. So you can tell them exactly what to eat and what not to eat we can for tell a particular them, individual. We can tell them what they probably should eat and should not eat. We can't <laughs> tell them what to do, but yeah, we can, we can suggest uh, what, they, what they can eat. And the idea is to stay within what food they normally eat and try to tell them what's best within that to be able to eat. Because we feel that's one way of ensuring that people will do it. Because otherwise, diets tend to be hard to follow. I think the thing that has stuck with me ever since we first started talking about this, and I've interviewed you a couple of times, is that my microbiome has a different genetic makeup than I do. And since my microbiome only lives in me, I can't figure out how that can be. How can that be? So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, the, the... You really ask difficult questions, <laughs> Stacey. I'm telling you, I think about it a lot. How can that be? No, so I mean, you know, it, the, the kind of bacteria that live within us are not just dictated by one thing. You know, it depends on what you eat, what your environment was when you were growing up, and what the environment is right now. If you're exposed to pets, if you, you know, are used to certain lifestyle habits like smoking. So all of those can dictate which would stay well. So it's almost think of it how we used to think of survival of the fittest. So if you throw a group of 100 bacteria based on everything you do to them, a few of them will survive. And those are the ones which can exist in that environment. So you're not just an individual who has certain genes. Okay, You're also an individual who does things, mm -hmm. and all of those affect the microbiome. Mm -hmm. And the reason microbiome is interesting is unlike your genes, we can affect and change in the microbiome, but we can't change the genes that we were born with. Is my microbiome like the cells of your body, you know, like how uh, your cells will age and thus change over time? Does your microbiome age? Yeah, well, it divides pretty quickly, so <laughs> it doesn't have the lifespan of what human cells are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, humans are a completely different kingdom. Um, so the bacteria are much smaller and uh, much smaller than the, even the cells, and, and their lifespan is short, and they perform the function, but they multiply very rapidly. All right, probiotics. What are they, and is there anyone who should be taking them? <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, so probiotics essentially means live organisms with a beneficial effect on the host. So that's how we typically define them, that they're live bacteria which have some known benefit to human beings. Um, should we be taking them? Again, it's, it's based on the studies that we have. There is very little evidence to suggest the use of probiotics in adults. We, haven't, we don't have good data to say that, oh, X individual should take this probiotic and it will either make them healthier in the long run because how do you measure health uh, or say that you will recover from this disease because we don't have the data for that. So as a result, no probiotic is FDA approved for that reason, right? And, and so they may have a beneficial effect on us, which is difficult to measure. But since we can't measure it, we can't tell people that you should take them. All right. A questionable benefit at best. Yeah. All right, the human microbiome. We are all full of bacteria, and they actually keep us healthy. And you and I should compare microbiomes someday. <laughs> yeah, we'll get on that. And when this population of bacteria is disrupted for whatever reason, it can cause serious health problems. In the Mayo Clinic microbiome program, questions about the relationship between the microbiome and health and disease are being studied. And what they're finding, absolutely fascinating. Our thanks to the co-director of the Mayo Clinic microbiome program, Dr. Perna Kashyap. Thanks Thank for joining us. Thank you for having me.